Welcome to Lesson 2 of Canadian French with Phil S, where today we're going to be talking about the vowels of Canadian French. Now, two closely linked components of linguistics are phonetics, or the sounds of a language, and phonology, or how languages organize their sound systems. Both are important, but today we're going to be focusing on phonetics. Learning to hear and produce the vowels of Canadian French early on will help you to better understand and speak the language as you acquire it progressively and expose yourself to other dialects of French. Note that you should not expect yourself to perfectly pronounce every vowel in Canadian French after watching this one video. Indeed, both English and French have spelling systems that are not very phonetic, unlike, say, Spanish or Korean. As such, there will be a learning curve, but using applied linguistics as a starting point, rather than outdated rote memorization techniques, seems like a good way to get on the right foot. Indeed, your goal should be to open your ears and start distinguishing the many vowels of Canadian French, even the more unique ones. Keep in mind that some linguists consider Canadian French to be the language with the second highest number of spoken vowels, so maybe you won't identify them all perfectly on day one. Throughout this program, however, there will be many opportunities to practice. And today we're going to be talking about 20 vowels specifically. What's more, most French speakers in Canada, not to mention abroad, are unable to do so unless they receive some type of guidance beforehand. As you may know, most people's true knowledge of their native language, regardless of their level of education, is subconscious. That being said, there's no time like the present, so let's start to learn the vowels of Canadian French with part one. And now the real fun begins with a flip chart, as usual. And before we get to what this all means, I'll just define a vowel, which is a speech sound produced without occluding, diverting, or obstructing the flow of air from the lungs, as opposed to a consonant. So we have the basic contrast of the vowel and consonant. We're going to focus on the vowels for this lesson. In this chart, you can see a diagram of your mouth. So this is used in linguistics to show the different areas where vowels are produced in a given language. In this case, uh, you can see that there are 20, in fact, one of them being a long vowel in green, and four of them being nasal, two, three, four, and then 15 other ones that are simply oral vowels. Um, so if you picture your mouth with this being the back, this being the middle, and then this being the front, that gives you a good idea. And also on this axis, you have close, close mid, open mid, and open positions. You'll notice that some of these letters are on the left side of the point, and other ones are on the right side. The reason for that is actually to do with your lips. So when it's on the left side of the indicated area, it's because your lips are not rounded for that. So in this example, we have the E, U contrast. So here the U sound is made using rounded lips. We only have one letter that's in the middle, and this is called the schwa, or the unstable E in French. We will get to that later, but for now, we're gonna content ourselves to say that we have here 20 letters that are used using the International Phonetic Alphabet, or IPA, and not that type of IPA, because you could have all you want only after the lesson. So we have four here, two here, five here, one, one, two, one, two, two. Uh, we also have the legend here um, that has the color chart. So I decided to divide this lesson um, into the first part, which has 16 overlapping vowels. And when I say overlapping, that has to do with the overlap between standard Canadian French and standard Canadian English. So thankfully, 16 out of the 20 vowels in Canadian French have a fairly strong degree of overlap with standard Canadian English. That doesn't mean that 
they are perfectly alike, but it does mean that you're in a much better position to produce those vowels, or at least distinguish them, with only a basis of English. So you'll see another diagram of the mouth here, as well as blue annotations that give examples. So what we're going to do is start in the top left, then go around, finish here, and then move on to the next page. As I mentioned, this sound, the lowercase i, represents e. So in, in French, that would be c, um, meaning yes or if, and in English, c as in moi, or to see something. The reason I use this as a first example is that it's a great um, case of a minimal pair. So in linguistics, when you want to indicate uh, a concept, or a contrast of some kind, you use two sounds that are almost exactly alike. So the perfect minimal pair has two sounds that are identical except for one characteristic. In reality, it's not always possible to find that ideal contrast. However, it's good enough for our purposes here to see what uh, differentiates these two sounds. So if this is C here, this one is actually sit, like to sit down. So you can see that in your mouth, it's a bit further back and a bit more towards mid-close as opposed to close. So the minimal pair that we have here is sit and s sorry, C and sit. So in this case, um, it works very well in English and in French. Um, sit means sight, and um, it also means the different types of sights, like uh, to cite um, an article, for example, it also works in French. But that's not important. We're just trying to show you the contrast between I and E. I, I. And on the other side, we have an interesting reflection of these two sounds. So, at the back of the mouth, in a closed position, we have the OO sound. So, I picked this example in French on purpose to test you, if you saw the first lesson, to see if you remember what the party hat or accent circonflex used to mean in French a long, long time ago. So, I'll give you a hint, it used to represent a specific consonant and uh, I'll give you a few seconds to try and remember which consonant this accent represented. So a long time ago, this accent used to mean the letter S. So ku in Middle Age French used to be something like kust. Now what word does that sound like in English? Cost. So Ku actually means cost in English. Um, the English example that I have here is a word of French origin. It's coup, like coup d'état or coup de grâce. Um, and I picked those examples because you have a good minimal pair here as well with could. And it's the same vowel as in could. Um, so once again, it's not a perfect example, but I wanted to show the contrast on this axis as well. So here you have the unrounded lips for E and I, and on the other side, you have rounded lips for U and U. I don't know if you find that pleasing, but for some reason I enjoy the symmetry of that, and it does actually happen quite a bit in linguistics. Moving on, we'll go down towards the mid-close position, where we have the word for water in French, so that's now pronounced O, where it used to be grey as a triptong a long time ago. The word that I picked in English is O, but I want to pronounce both of those words for about three seconds, and you tell me if you hear a difference. Okay, so we have the French version, O, and, and then we have the English version, O. 
So if you're paying attention, and if I did it correctly, um, there is actually uh, a rounding in uh, the English uh, version of the word. So in this specific context in English, something happens to this vowel. It's not simply O as in French, but it becomes O, like a bow. But um, this is a concept that we'll have to go over. Essentially, English is an interesting language where there's a lot of things that happens to the vowels, much like in Canadian French, but they're not identical. So for now, we'll say that these vowels are pretty similar, O and O, and we'll work on maintaining um, a non-rounded variation of that French word. So the next example is actually very straightforward. It's another rounded vowel. And in English, the word is but, meaning I wanted to do this, but. And in French, we have the word for boot, which is pronounced but. So that's very straightforward and uh, there shouldn't be any issues there. Moving on, we're now up to uh, open vowel at the back of the mouth. And um, we'll stick with the oral version for now. In English, if you think of the word pot, that's very close to how we pronounce this word in French, pout. And when I say French, I do mean Canadian French because that's not how they would pronounce it in international French. So once again, we have the party hat, access of conflict, and uh, we know that it represents, or it used to represent the S sound. So pout used to be something like post. And if you had to guess what it meant in English, you would be correct if you guessed that it does mean pasta in English. So um, it is a diphthong, pout. And we'll go into more details another time, but I've reserved diphthongs for another lesson because it might get too complicated otherwise. Here, however, we have the first example of a nasal vowel, and this is pretty straightforward example. In English, if you think of the word taunt, uh, we have something similar in French, which is pounce. Pounce means smoke, by the way. So, en, en, aunt. It's very close. It's it should be pretty straightforward. And I have more examples later on that I'll be sharing with you. So once again, the contrast is pount and taunt. So now we'll move towards the front of the mouth for another example that's very straightforward. So pat, as in to pat someone on the back or a short form of Patrick. Um, in French, we would write pat, and that means paw. So um, I picked this example on purpose because we have here pout and pat, where this contrast does not exist in international French, it definitely exists in many parts of Canada. So here, this A means pat. Here we have five vowels that I uh, drew up in this table because it was getting kind of crowded in the chart. So we'll start with an easy one. So fe, like uh, the past form of to feed, fed, Fe, with the only difference really being uh, the D at the end in English. The second example is a nasal vowel once again. So in French we have main, like hand. And in English you simply have to pronounce the word main without uh, the consonant N at the end. So in English main becomes main. And it's pretty close uh, as a minimal pair. So I like that example. Of course, uh, if you remember once again why uh, Canadian French has these oral vowels, it's, it, it used to be much closer to the English pronunciation in a sense, where it'd be main. And uh, the French, wanting to speak more quickly, kept the nasal component of the consonant and then just added that to the vowels. So ein became ein. That's not that important, but at least you know how to pronounce this particular vowel. So we go to the only long vowel that we're discussing today. 
And the example from uh, the first lesson actually is fight. So to fight or do battle, we have uh, the French variation of it. Um, you know, it's an excess of conflicts or a party hat. What does fight mean in English? It is indeed party, well, very similar to the fiesta in Espanol. Moving on, we have uh, number four. Um, you probably have seen this word before if you like French music or if you're somewhat familiar with the language. And this is pronounced car, so that means heart. And uh, I wanted to pick this one because it's actually the same vowel or symbol, let's say, as the International Phonetic Alphabet. So um, the comparable example we have in English for car is cart. It's good enough for our purposes. No, um, the French and English R's are not the same, but we're not getting into that at this point. So R is good enough for us. Um, and then finally, the last example for the mid-open position is a word that's very common in French. It means one, it's un. So if you think of the word weren't, earned, that's close enough for our purposes to distinguish this other sound. So once again, we'll be going over that in another lesson, but un, similar to a part of weren't. And finally, we have our last two vowels for this page. So on the left side, we have the unrounded variation. So the French word that we have here meaning T is T. And what I wrote as an example in English is cake. Now, if you, play, if you pay close attention or if you know this beforehand, this is actually a diphthong. So it kind of starts here and then goes up. So it's A, and it's not, um, you know, a one for one example, but it, it does appear in that diphthong. So it's E, in this case, T, and take is good enough for our purposes to kind of give you something to work with. On the other side, we have this, which you know, makes me think of zero in math. But um, in French, uh, one example would be sur. Um, I know it's an odd way to spell it. We'll go over that another time. It means the masculine form of those. And uh, in English, we have sir, as in hello, sir, sir, ma'am, that kind of thing. And that's not bad. That's 16 out of 20 or 80% of the vowels that we want to see today. Unfortunately, we have to go to the difficult vowels and review. So um, let's go from easiest to hardest, uh, starting in the, in the front and closed axis, axes. Um, so we have the E here, and then on the other side we have U. So this sound does not exist in English, and I hear a lot of Anglophones that uh, try to speak French struggle with that particular sound. One way of approaching it is to pronounce the word li with rounded lips. So e, with it being on the left side, has unrounded lips. And if you go from e to u, you have eu or lu in this example. So Li becomes Lu. This, I'm not really providing that many exercises for this specific lesson, but truth be told, it's already pretty dense and I didn't want to overwhelm you with that at this point. However, I will be providing many examples in a link at the end of this lesson and I will be making other videos with actual things to practice. So at the very least, we have a good minimal pair. So the top we have lu, and here we have lut, so u, u. Um, a good way of going about it is uh, pronouncing the word lit, so e becomes u, so li, lu. And um, it is difficult even for me to do 
because while these two sounds do exist, they don't have a, a difference in meaning and they only appear in certain contexts. You may have figured that out by now if you're really um, adept to that type of thinking. But essentially, when this <laughs> vowel um, comes in contact with like a T or a D, it uh, becomes lowered a little bit. So if you go from lit to le, um, you, you get to pronounce those two vowels correctly. So here we have I, E, U, 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 U. And we'll move on to number 19, which is the last nasal vowel. One example for this word is con, which kind of means dense or stupid. And um, I would like you to use your imagination a little bit for this one. So if you can imagine a British accent, or if you could speak with a half decent one, um, you'll know that con is not pronounced exactly the same way here in Canada. So con becomes something like con with a, a British accent. And the reason I mention this is that it's a lot more similar to the French sound. Once again, this word finishes with the consonant N, so we don't pronounce the N in French, but we get the nasal component of it. So essentially, we say con in French, and then in Canadian English, we say con. In British English, we say con, and with uh, dropping the final N with a British accent, it becomes something like con. And the contrast between this hypothetical British accent word and the French one would be con and con. So we'll get back to that. Another example would be the word can't with a British accent. It would be something like can't. So con and in French con. So that's a decent start. And let's go to number 20. This is known as the unstable E because it changes based on the context. Because I believe that this lesson has gone over enough difficult topics, I'm going to review that in a later lesson. But suffice it to say that le would be one example. Le, ce, me, those type of words are examples of the schwa or unstable E. Finally, we have um, a table here of all the different sounds that we reviewed today. So once again, there are four nasal vowels and one long oral vowel. And then in total, you do four times five, that's 20. Now, I'm not trying to uh, scare you off, but uh, I will say that we're not gonna go and review <laughs> this final page. Because as you can see, there's quite a bit of information. I took the 20 vowels here, and then I've added three examples, with them being three French examples in every case, and then in most cases, three English examples. As I mentioned before, I'm going to provide a link to this list on wherever I post this video, and um, that will be a good starting point. So this is lesson number two, and it's part one of the lesson on vowels. So part two, we're going to be addressing this and um, helping you further open your ears to understand the differences, especially with um, the similar sounds, as well as practice them. And then essentially that will help you produce the sounds over the long term. And um, I know that when you read an article in the newspaper, um, it's written not, it's not written using the IPA. So uh, I will be providing you with examples of words using the standard uh, writing system. So I think that will be very useful for you, but this lesson has been very densely packed with information. And uh, with this being only an introduction to the vowels of Canadian French, I wanted to give you a bit of breathing room as well as provide me with uh, some time to really 
give you a good overview of this. Um, I did quite a bit of research for this lesson. I would say between 25 and 30 hours just on the vowels of Canadian French. And uh, after about hour 10, I realized that it would be too much to present all in one sitting. So thank you so much for your time. I would love it if you could uh, like, share, subscribe, that type of thing, because um, I feel like I'm on the right path with this program. And uh, the more eyeballs that we can get on it, that would be really helpful for me. So once again, um, feel free to come back to this lesson. It's perfect. It's purposely pretty densely packed. And uh, as I said in the introduction, you're not going to be able to perfectly identify these 20 vowels on day one necessarily, but I will be providing lots of examples to help you along the way. So thanks again and à la prochaine.